Good morning. So in this lecture, we're going to finally approach the Bessel equation in the context of solving a boundary value problem in cylindrical coordinates. So they basically um, seeing the Bessel equation as a Sturmeville problem. There is a little bit more to do uh, before we actually end up solving from top to finish a boundary value problem. So we won't do that today. But uh, in this lecture, again, we're going to focus primarily on how um, we deal with the Bessel equation in the context of finding eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So before we do that, let me um, point out to a quite straightforward homework problem. Uh, not, a, not difficult at all. The homework problem indicates how you, you solve it. It's just a small substitution and some um, derivatives taken. Uh, but that homework problem is important because it deals with how you make the connection between what we call the standard Bessel equation and the modified Bessel equation, which the modified version is what appears in fact in, in the context of the boundary value problems. So once again, um, the standard format of the Bessel equation of order n, as you know already, uh, is given by this format. So basically that's the, uh, um, the Bessel equation of order n. And the general solution of it is the um, linear combination of Bessel equation of first kind, Bessel equation of the second kind. The one that, remember, is discontinuous at zero. So the modified Bessel equation of order n is really the same, but it has a positive constant multiplied by x squared. And because it's positive, that constant is denoted typically by a square. Uh, in our book, this is denoted by alpha squared x squared minus n squared y equals 0. So that constant is alpha squared. So this is the type of equation we're going to encounter in the, in the context of the boundary value problems. Again, let's call this one modified uh, Bessel equation of order n. And the homework asks you to prove that the general solution of this modified version is some combination of Jn alpha x plus C2 Yn of alpha x. So it's not really much to do in the homework. You basically make a substitution between um, you denote alpha x by a new variable, and you can prove easily that uh, when you do that substitution, you basically, in the new, in the terms of the new variable, you end up with the standard form for the Bessel equation. So that's why uh, once you have a different constant here than one, the solution is not just this, but it's Jn evaluated at alpha x, Yn evaluated at alpha x instead of just x. And by the way, pay attention here. This is the reason why we often denote these constants by a square um, instead of uh, just alpha k, whatever, or lambda. Because if you do that in the solution, you will all have to carry over that square root, which is kind of tedious if you, if you do that. So to avoid writing square root of something times x, we might as well denote that positive constant by alpha square. And uh, you will see later that basically alpha squared will be your eigenvalue. Um, well, I mean, related to alpha squared. I mean, this is, this is where the eigenvalues come from, as you will see in today's lecture. So um, with that being said, let's remember the motivation for the whole um, chapter on Bessel equations, namely the boundary value problems in cylindrical coordinates. If you want, you can go back to lecture six a little bit, where we introduce the heat equation in cylindrical coordinates when the temperature depending on the radius and the time only. So u of rho t was um, the temperature of a cylindrical object, right? But again, under the assumption that um, the temperature depends on the radius and on the time only. And let's uh, say the domain of rho is C. So again, C is the outer radius 
right? So the radius of the cross section of the of the cylinder. And in addition to this domain, let's establish some boundary conditions now. So suppose that we have uh, zero temperature. on the outer edge. So a Dirichlet type condition, meaning that u of ct is equal to zero. So that is the boundary condition, which is actually sufficient, if you think about it, if we assume that the heat flows across the radius, you only need to specify, of course, the temperature on the boundary, but the boundary now is given by completely by this condition. Okay, so C is the radius, the outer radius. So if at all time um, the temperature on the exterior of the object is zero, then this condition um, indicates just that. Um, other than that, the temperature should be a continuous function with finite values, of course, at all points on the object. Remember, the continuity assumptions will actually give us the fact that C2 must be zero since Yn, the Bessel function of the second kind, is discontinuous at zero. Then we're going to have an initial condition, namely that the initial temperature uh, should be some function of rho, which is a known function. But we're going to deal with that a little bit later when time comes to use superposition principle. And we can do that much later once we um, understand how we obtain um, series in terms of the Bessel functions. So for now I want you to focus on the um, boundary condition and how that impacts the solutions of the Sturmlevin problem in the Bessel equation form. So we did already this in lecture 6 but let's remember that if you use separation of variables, so if you denote the temperature by a product of a function in rho and a function in t, well, for one, notice that if I apply the initial, the boundary condition given here, so u of c t, that's equal to r of c t of t equals zero, that leads to r of c equals zero. And let's keep that in mind as well. If we proceed with the separation of variables, the Sturmlevin problem We already showed it's given by um, rho r double prime plus r prime plus lambda rho r equals zero. So again, pay attention here and go slow and pause if you need to, because sometimes people have troubles matching this or seeing this as what it is, namely a Bessel equation of order zero in the modified form. So one point of confusion is because you don't have R rho squared here. But if you look carefully, if I multiply the entire equality by rho, and if you replace n is equal to zero, n with zero, right, in this general form, you get basically what uh, you, this format with n equals zero and lambda uh, instead of alpha squared. So at this point, basically, let's replace lambda with alpha squared. And you could do that from the beginning, right? That separation constant lambda, you might as well replace it by alpha squared in anticipation of the fact that it's going to match this type of equation. So this multiplication by rho is optional. I'm going to just do it just to convince yourselves that this is of this type with lambda equal to alpha squared and n equals zero. So again, if I multiply by rho the entire equality, um, I'm going to get rho squared r double prime plus rho r prime plus alpha squared um, rho squared, right? Because I multiply by the extra rho minus zero squared r equals zero. Again, I'm writing that minus zero squared just to see that it is of this type. Because again, only when n is equal to zero, 
one is able to divide by x if x is positive, right? So when you do the separation of variables, you end up with just row with not, no row in the middle and just row on the last term, okay? But really, if you put an extra row all the way through, if you multiply by row, you get basically Bessel equation of order zero. But of course, in practice, you don't need to multiply this row. You just need to recognize that this is of order zero and you need to recognize that the solution is of this format. So from now on, again, replace lambda with alpha squared when you do it, uh, when you recognize that you're going to need the Bessel functions. <clears throat> and you don't need to multiply by row, just recognize that the general solution of the um, of this uh, Sturmovin problem, namely big R of rho, is some combination of J naught, because n is zero, remember, of alpha rho plus C2 Y naught of alpha rho. This moment is analogous to solving the previous Sturmloville problem in which the solution was a combination of sine and cosine, if you remember. So it was something like C1 sine of, uh, or square root of lambda in that case, x, C2 square root of lambda x, or something like that. So that's the analogous to that step. Um, <clears throat> And at this point, the idea is to figure out the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions from the boundary conditions. Remember, the eigenvalues will be essentially values for lambda or for alpha squared, if you want. Okay, So you're going to find various alphas, and then, of course, the eigenvalues will be alpha squared. And then the corresponding functions to that uh, lambda will be the eigenfunction. So remember, the continuity assumption is a boundary condition on its own, right? So because of the continuity assumption, so the continuity requirement, if you want, leads to C2 equals 0. Again, because Y0 is discontinuous at 0 and infinite. Right, so physical requirements require that C2 must be zero, which means C1 must not be equal to zero. Otherwise, we're going to have a trivial solutions, which we don't want. We want non-trivial solutions. So now it's the time to impose the second boundary condition, right? I mean, the, the real boundary condition except the continuity one, right? So one boundary condition in this case, because it's of a Dirichlet type, right, a homogeneous boundary condition, states that R of C must be equal to zero. Since C1 is not equal to zero and C2 is equal to zero, that means this condition leads to J naught of alpha C equals zero. So the Dirichlet condition for a boundary valid problem on the interval 0c leads to the condition that the vessel function j naught evaluated at alpha c should be equal to 0. So in order to make it a little bit easier to understand, again, this is really analogous to what you end up with in the previous cases when you solve boundary value problem with sine of square root of lambda x equals 0. So you ended up with this condition. This was one part of the solution. And remember, this was the equality that gave you the, um, I'm sorry, sine of uh, square root of lambda c equals 0, not x. So when you apply the boundary condition on the interval 0, c, you ended up with something like this. And then from that point, you concluded that root lambda c must be equal to a multiple of pi because sine of a multiple of pi is equal to zero, which eventually gave you the eigenvalues n pi over c squared. So I'm, I'm making this little detour because it's very important to understand that this is the same type of situation we encounter at this moment in the problem. 
okay? We encounter a boundary condition, which hopefully will give us infinitely many solutions that will lead to um, our eigenvalues. So, so far, this moment was an encounter in the previous case when we had other Stoglodian problems. Um, when we ended up imposing that the solution evaluated at C is zero, which led us to sign of root lambda C equals zero in the Dirichlet uh, type of conditions, right? So when we had that condition, we said, well, not only I can tell what, um, what lambda should be in this case, but I actually can find infinitely many lambdas that fit this equality. Sign of any multiple of pi is zero, which leads to lambda being n pi over c squared equals zero, and n can be one, two, three, and so on. So infinitely many non-trivial solutions. Now, going back to the Bessel equation, hopefully this one will give us, again, infinitely many solutions. And they do, right? I mean, this equality does give us infinitely many solutions. At this moment, it might be worthwhile to pause this video and go back to the video that I made on Maple when I showed you that if you plot the Bessel function, you will notice that it intersects the x-axis infinitely many times. So not only you do have an alpha that fits this equation. So remember, the question is, if j naught of alpha c equals zero, can you find a solution alpha? Not only we can find such a solution, but in fact, we have infinitely many solutions of these equations. So infinitely many solutions, which we can denote them by alpha one, alpha two, alpha j, and so on, um, that fit this equation. So <clears throat> from this point on, and we're going to write it again on the second uh, piece of paper, these um, solutions, alpha 1, alpha 2, or these um, notations, alpha 1, alpha 2, and so, on, and so on, alpha j, denote the solutions of the equation j naught of alpha c equals 0. Um, what's different than in the previous case is that you don't have an explicit form for these roots. One can only approximate these roots um, to any degree of precision you want. But since we cannot have a specific format or a specific value, like here, we're going to just assume basically that we found them and we just denote them as alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on. And we consider these alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on as known numbers, namely the roots of the equation j naught of alpha c equals 0. So let's put together uh, what we just discussed here on a second page and then discuss how we move from that point on. So stay tuned for the second part.